Yes, we are. Okay. So um, welcome everybody to this uh, second Young Scientist session uh, of today. Uh, it's great uh, to have you here. Um, we have four speakers this session, which will last until 3.30. Um, and which means that every presenter has 15 minutes for the presentation and then we have around seven minutes for the discussion. I would also really welcome you to uh, join the discussion, um, both all presenters and all other participants, um, because I think that's one of the nice things of the Young Scientist sessions, that it's about new research, but it's also about getting new ideas and giving comments and suggestions, which is one of the valuable things of the Young Scientist sessions. Also, I will be very strict with the time. Because, uh, like Maristella explained, uh, in, the, in this system, uh, the session will just end exactly at the time it's supposed to end. So it will go black. So it will be unfair for the final speaker to have less time. So, uh, so I don't think I'm rude. I'm just trying to be precise and to stick to the time. And one other uh, comment I would like to make is that for the questions or suggestions, please use the chat. So not the live Q&A, but the chat which we'll see directly in Zoom. And then um, I will also um, um, redirect the questions to the presenters, but we can also all uh, see the, the questions. So again, a very high, warm welcome to everyone. And I would like to invite uh, Flavio Bizana um, from, from the University of Potsdam to give the first presentation about uh, declining uh, cities, population shrinkage in cities. Hello, hello everybody, and uh, and thanks for giving me for the introduction and this presentation. Um, I'm asking if you see my screen right now correctly. Okay, so um, as I was saying, um, as you mentioned in the introduction, my my presentation of today is about. Uh, Shrinking cities in the in in Europe and in the EU, um, not only in a present perspective, but I will try to introduce a, a future perspe perspective on shrinking cities to look at pathways uh, from the past towards the future, uh, with the main objective of raising awareness at European level about the topic and giving a European-wide perspective that crosses uh, borders. Um, first, uh, a few words of, of content, context about this, this research, which is part of um, Marie Curie uh, Innovative Training Network, which is called Reviving Shrinking Cities, which is a network of researchers that, uh, of 13 PhD students and, and their supervisors of the universities across Europe, that look into ways to understand the phenomenon of shrinking cities. Uh, studied from different perspectives, from a sociologist to uh, urban planning and environmental perspectives, among others, and, uh, and try to find solutions on how to, to revive them. Um, my project in particular is supervised by uh, Dr. Kai Burme, uh, Director of uh, Special Foresight, which is an independent think tank in Luxembourg, and is co-supervised by the University of Poznan and the professor named uh, Tadeusz Triakiewicz. Also some uh, collaborations within the project with um, the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in, um, in Leipzig. And if you want to know a bit more about the project there, you have some, some links to, um, to LinkedIn and we also have a blog. And, um, and then now I will dive into the, the presentation of the paper, which is in this context of shrinking cities. Uh, so first of all, I, um, I would like to uh, say uh, a couple words about what are shrinking cities, what is their definition, uh, at least in Europe. So according to the, to the Shrinking City International Research Network, shrinking cities are a urbanized area with a minimum population of 5,000 residents that has faced a remarkable population loss in the past five years, or continuous population loss of more than 0.15% of, uh, of their population. Um, this is the operational definition. So basically the signal uh, to identify uh, shrinking cities. 
Then with the concept of shrinking cities is much more wide because shrinkage uh, events, uh, namely population loss, involve much more than just this demographic aspect, but it's always uh, intertwined with um, with causes and effects and symptoms that uh, that um, pertain to social, economic, and uh, and other factors that that might drive this uh, these dynamics or be the effects. Uh, for instance, you can see uh, how to identify visually shrinking cities while while walking around Europe. Uh, typical signs and symptoms of shrinking cities is where you, where you find um, evident um, number of empty housing stocks or uh, empty shop windows even in, in central areas. So this is like something that you can, the most tangible um, 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 signals and symbols that you can see uh, that shrinking cities, shrinking cities typically um, typically display. And um, as something that it's already part of a, one of the, the results of this research that I'm presenting today is that the dimension of this phenomenon of a shrinkage in Europe is quite extensive. Uh, almost 25% of, of all European municipalities intended as administrative units are um, qualify as shrinking. So they have the declining population at different intensities in the period of observation of this uh, past uh, almost 30 years. And um, therefore, this paper wants to um, shed light on this phenomenon, investigate it from a, a demographic perspective, for instance, not only in the past, but looking into the future. So if now we, are already, we have already a, a fourth of European municipalities that face this shrinkage dynamics, what will be in the future? So with the final objective of raising awareness of European, of European policy making around um, a growing challenge uh, that requires probably given the magnitude, um, a unified uh, approach and a, a structured approach towards it. Um, so how to, to study the phenomenon and, uh, and, and what I, I used for um, looking into shrinking cities is uh, a combination of historical data with three different sources, mainly Eurostat and national statistical offices, and already made projections made by Eurostat at NATS three level. So it's a provincial area, uh, provincial geographical units. To extrapolate, a, good enough, let's say, proxy of uh, the municipality population in 2050. So methodologi methodologically speaking, in, in rather simple words, the projection is the result of two components, a linear projection solely based on municipal historical data, and uh, another component uh, that uses the shared growth model that combines both historical and ready-made projected data. These two components are, um, are calibrated and, and combined, put together with a weighting system of, um, of two coefficients. Uh, roughly, these two coefficients wants to, uh, want to correct the, the formula, adjust it, and they answer to each one to two main questions. So how did the municipality population change compared to its NATS3 area, meaning the provincial area, in the past? So if there were diverging trajectories or uh, rather uh, similar and in which uh, dimension they were similar, of course. And, um, and then the second question to adjust the formula is how big, so how influent is the municipality of observation in its provincial area? So to understand and assign a greater importance to the projection at the three level, if the municipality is bigger or on the, the other way around to assign a greater role to the, to the local um, linear data in case the municipality is very small compared to the, to the area. Uh, so this is the formula without uh, getting into, into too much detail. This allowed me to project the population of European municipalities, shrinking municipalities, to, to, to 2050. 
And um, the main findings uh, in terms, in quantitative terms, is that shrinkage and its threatening dy dynamics will expand the relevance further until uh, 2050. After they have been establishing as a solid trend in the past 30 years, in uh, as we said, in 25% already of Europe's municipalities. So this is no cyclic event nor uh, an episodic event. It's uh, it's a persistent trend that needs to be addressed, basically. So among uh, these 25% of European municipalities, 77% of current shrinking municipalities will continue on their population decline path at equal or greater intensity of population loss. Almost 85% of them will experience a greater intensity of population loss, which is in, in the, in, reflected also in the macro trends of population decline in Europe. So even between two times and, and eight times the baseline value of the definition uh, presented in earlier. Only 10% are predicted to initiate a, a stabilization process, meaning that they will continue shrinking at a lower level of intensity. This does not tell a lot because it, it can be municipalities that have lost uh, in these past 30 years, 30% 30 of their population. Now they naturally reduce the pace, but there's still something to be tackled. And then only 3% are predicted to start a regrowth uh, path uh, from now to, to 2050. In addition, it was possible to identify um, additional areas where a shrinking would become a reality. So 15% of all European provi provinces, so not three areas, that did not shrink in the past will face significant shrinking popula uh, population decline in the near future and other municipalities that did not qualify as shrinking before but started in the in the very last years a path of population decline will be continuing this population decline so basically the phenomenon is on the rise and starts already from a from a big um a considerable um, volume so maybe moving towards uh, some conclusions. So um, apart from the, the magnitude of the, of the phenomena and, it, and its future relevance, uh, we can say there is, a, there is a strong territorial dimension in episodes of shrinkage as the geography of incidents displays very different patterns across Europe. So with countries that experienced this since the beginning in 1991, on the period of observation with a more uh, spread uh, manifestation in the in the country some countries uh, have uh, very localized effects uh, episodes of shrinkage some countries started later in the years these processes there's a diff different part geographical patterns to this uh, shrinkage problem so the the increasing volume and extension of, of shrinkage pro processes shall elevate the challenge to the European levels of policy making in order to orchestrate a unified approach, basically because the EU has the firepower and the opportunity to, to steer um, a needed response strategy to this, um, to this issue. Um, in this domain, cross-national typologies of shrinking cities, uh, typologies that embed not only this demographic aspect but to go beyond and include contextual features characteristics of the region of the socio-economic fabric are able to enrich the design of solutions and favor uh, the crafting of more eff effective policy responses to do, to do this uh, some tools might be of, uh, of very good use such as the territorial impact assessment um, and territorial foresight that are both tools that favor ex ante impact assessment of the of the territorial implication of, of policies and they're used right now at European at European level for some policies and it is an opportunity to to use them in shrinking context uh, to understand with an ex ante approach and include plain sensitive information and plain specific information in that can help curb uh, shrinking trajectories. 
Um, lastly, uh, of course, COVID will play a role. So in the past uh, month, we've been researching into into the um, the sensitivity and the exposure of European regions to the to to the potential COVID crisis in terms of uh, the socioeconomic fabric of regions. And um, I'm right now currently trying to overlay uh, this information with the geographies of, of shrinkage uh, that constitute the body of, of the paper I'm presenting today. In order to understand and find out the preliminary impacts of COVID-19 in these places that have already a very delicate um, um, reality and, and therefore need uh, a special attention and special care as the, the crisis dynamics have started lo long ago and, and it can be um, e even more, even sourer uh, in this uh, situation. But this, um, this is a link to a paper that we publish on the regional sensitivities and, and more publication that will come in case you're interested also in COVID-related regional uh, research. So um, this was all uh, from my side for this presentation. And I would like to thank you for, for the attention and, and, and for your time. And I'm happy to, to answer all your questions, be it methodological, methodological or just out of curiosity of, on shrinking cities and thank you very much you Flavio you're mm -hmm. exactly uh, on time uh, and thank you for, uh, for a an, very interesting presentation I would like to welcome all the participants to uh, if you have any questions to raise them in the chat uh, so in the chat of um, uh, of the portal so not in the in the live Q&A but in the chat uh, so if you have any questions or comments or congratulations please um, put them write them down in the chat um, and, and I would like to start with a few questions. It's a, also a topic that I'm, I'm really interested in. And uh, you might know that with Rachel Franklin, we also wrote a paper about population decline. That is something that needs to be much more studied in regional science because we are so much focusing on growth. And we don't even have the tools sometimes to look at decline. Mm -hmm. uh, and also that it's something that's taking place in cities as well, not only in some remote rural area. So mm -hmm. I, I really think that you cover a very interesting topic and also a very relevant topic. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I have two questions basically. Um, first of all is uh, you look, do you look at household or at persons? Because population decline in terms of households might be different uh, compared to population decline in, in, in person. So many places there is a population decline in the number of people, but it ne doesn't necessarily mean that the number of households decline as well. It's just that the households are becoming smaller. Mm -hmm. um, that's my first question. And my second question is, how, how do you take into account migration? I suppose it's also included in the existing projections, but of course migration is something that is more difficult to predict. And my experience with the COVID-19 situation now is, for example, we see for the first time since a long period, decline in the Amsterdam city because people try, they try, they try to leave the city to move to more rural areas. So mm -hmm. can you also put that, include that in your, in your future model? Thank you very much for, uh, for your question. I'm, I'm happy to hear that there's uh, already even mo more and more uh, people researching these topics. And I will um, dig more into, into your research as well. So as, as far as the first question is concerned, in this um, study, I'm focusing on, on residential populations, so just the number of, of population coming uh, from the Europe census. So it means really uh, not households, but but population i i totally um share your uh, your opinion on the fact that this is uh, partly flawed it is uh, it is part of the limitation of course of this research when when it's done at european level now that you mention it it's probably uh, statistics at municipal level with household uh are harder to to get uh, european wide of course so this is 
part of the limitations. I, I, I did not um, I did not consider it beforehand, but I I'm noting it down as a as a possibility when you, when you do more in depth studies or, or or case studies, for instance, that can shed light, uh, for instance, on one region. But there you can actually get uh, deeper into into the um, into the issue. Um, the second question as um, a bit of the same, uh, a bit of the same problem, of course. Migration is um, is embedded is embedded uh, in the NATS three projections uh, made by Eurostat that involve uh, mainly demographic uh, aging and birth ratio aspects, as well as uh, as well as internal and external migration. So from this side, this is covered by by the 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 parent area projections uh, even though uh, as you as you say there are all uh, these kind of dynamics that i i i read a lot about and i'm and i'm aware and i i i share your view that in some cases for uh, for some towns for some cities uh it can be um it can be true that the, if you look at only the administrative level, uh, the statistics based only a residential population might be lying to a certain extent. However, it's um, again when doing a European wide analysis, it's it's hard to capture this this dynamics. It's uh, it, it it has to be kept in mind. Um, but here I'm more interested in the magnitude of the of the, of the phenomenon at, at European level, and of course in a city like like Amsterdam, still this is not uh, not yet visible in the statistics. So maybe it, it is something new that needs to be taken into account for a more also qualitative aspect of the research. Um, can, can I sorry to interrupt you? There are two more questions from from the audience also, and we have around two more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and one question is from Andreas Diemer, one of the presenters. He says, "Thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if you can discuss the definition of shrinking city. How are we to think of 0.15 percent population loss yearly in terms of magnitude? Is there a distribution we can benchmark this with?" And Thomas Dentinho asked, "Is spatial interaction included in your model?" So could you try to give short answers to both questions in two minutes? Yes. So um, being very honest, the, the threshold for population decline is the, um, is the result of uh, empir empirical research. So basically either a case study based research that looked into, um, into cases of shrinking cities while defining them and based on uh, on um, uh, the frequency that, that you could observe in, in this kind of cities, this has been established in the early thousands as the, as the benchmark. So um, it is a, a sort of uh, empirically established that now we build upon, but the, the, the shrinking city definition is uh, always and, and now even more up to, um, to definitions, so to, 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 to new definitions and redefinitions. So it's always uh, a bit um, under question, of course, because it's, uh, it is so a bit, a bit blurry or uh, there's no um, unified, there is unified, but it's, uh, it's limited. It's limited to this, um, to this way that it's, it has been constructed. So um, happy to have suggestion if you have, or if you have uh, other benchmark to which we can compare. Um, as for uh, spatial interaction, this is not uh, not considered in this in this research. So functional urban areas are not considered, for instance, or other dimension of spatial interactions are not. This is, um, of course, again for the wide scope of the research, I, I used. Um, residential and uh, administrative units uh, even it, it it's it would be very fascinating to to look into spatial dynamics of of it because understand that it's 
there are some limitations when, when taking this approach. And, and okay, thank, thank you very much, Flavio, for your presentation again and also for your answers. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to be a bit rude, but um, like I said, in, in, for, for time. And also for Andreas um, to give him the floor to give his presentation. Um, welcome, the floor is yours, Andreas. I thought I was going first, but that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, Andreas, sorry. Oh, uh, hi, uh, I don't mind. Um, Okay. Well, no, Andre, so, sorry, uh, Caroline. He's the second on the on the on the, on the program, so we stick sorry, to the yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Fantastic. Um, right. Well, first off, thanks for having me and giving me the opportunity to present. Uh, the paper I present today is um, is uh, fresh out of my PhD. Uh, I'm given the time constraint. I'm going to skim through uh, the, the the paper content and highlight certain results. Uh, if you're interested, uh, uh, there's a recently released uh, discussion paper uh, on the LSE geography and environment uh, uh, discussion paper series. It's online. You you can have a look for further details. Uh, and uh, don't hesitate to contact me for any further feedback and comments. They're always much, uh, uh, much welcome. Um, all right, so just to give you uh, a brief uh, overview of uh, the paper in a nutshell, the question I'm asking is whether uh, people interacting over social networks uh, can somehow uh, support the diffusion of uh, um, shocks that are economic shocks that are localized in space. Um, and so uh, the definition of shock I use uh, aligns with a, uh, with a paper uh, published not long ago by fireman Sorenzo Sordori. Uh, uh, and um, so I rely on uh, uh, fracking shocks, uh, which are very local in nature. Uh, and then the definition of social networks uh, is based on a novel index uh, uh, that's, um, uh, that uses uh, online friendships, in particular friendships over Facebook, uh, to get an idea of how connected uh, socially places are to each other. Uh, uh, in the United States. And uh, so the scope of my analysis is the United States at the level of US counties between 2004 and uh, uh, 2012. Um, in terms of empirical strategy, just to give you a preview, uh, I will basically be estimating some kind of uh, spatial econometric uh, uh, model uh, where I consider uh, uh, inverse differences on outcome, uh, mainly wages, I'll focus on wages in this presentation, uh, as a function uh, of uh, uh, new oil and gas extraction in the county uh, itself, uh, as well as some spatial average, uh, uh, either in the social or in the geographical space of these shocks that are, that are accrue to geographical or social neighbors. Uh, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be giving a few more details about this uh, um, later on in the presentation. But crucial here is that I'm not interested in the geographical dimension in and of itself. I want to see uh, controlling for that, uh, whether or not uh, uh, social networks matter. Uh, so above and beyond that in explaining spatial diffusion of these shocks. Um, and the motivation for this is that if we just consider uh, the correlation of economic outcomes here in the left-hand side panel, uh, I show income per capita, and uh, on the right-hand side, uh, I show employment. If we consider the correlation of these outcomes over, uh, uh, over counties that are socially connected with each other, uh, we see that they're, they're quite positively correlated. Um, and we can't take this immediately uh, on face value as a, as a as evidence of the existence of kind of uh, network effects in, in the fusion of shocks, uh, because there could be something else unobserved, uh, for instance, that defines uh, both the fact that these counties are connected with each, with each other uh, and uh, uh, at the same time independently also affects their outcomes. Um, and so what Mansky calls uh, correlated effects. And so the idea here is to exploit the exogenous or plausibly exogenous nature of these uh, uh, fracking shocks, which depend largely to the pre-existing geology, uh, to get an idea of whether or not there is indeed diffusion over networks. Um, and uh, to give you some context in terms of uh, the, these fracking shocks, uh, fracking is a technology that developed in, uh, in the US. Well, it had been existing uh, since the uh, late 70s, I believe, but it's really become uh, used uh, um, on a wide scale uh, from 2004 onwards. Uh, and uh, um, uh, this is based on uh, information from the US Energy Information Administration. Uh, you'll notice that by uh, late 2011, 
um, it became uh, the majority of uh, um, the, the main technology for extraction of new uh, oil and gas resources. So this is kind of the, the shock I'm exploiting um, on aggregate. And on aggregate, we see that it's, uh, it's an economically relevant shock because if we look at the industry, uh, whether or not uh, within drilling, extraction, or kind of support activities, uh, employment and wages have grown by uh, 60 to uh, uh, up to 100% over the period uh, that, um, that I consider. Um, and so the, the, I guess the purpose of this paper is to see whether um, uh, social interaction between, between people in different counties can help explain the geography of how these shocks are felt across different places in the US. Um, and this matters because there's anecdotal evidence considering the sociological literature of the fracking industry uh, that the industry relies largely on non-local workers. So these are itinerant workers who um, are often active on several different sites uh, across the region. Um, and it means that um, the, 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 the gains that um, accrue around the dwells or the wages that are, that are earned here actually could end up leaving the host community and end up benefiting communities elsewhere, depending on where these, uh, these workers are coming from, uh, because you could think of them as commuting almost over long distances and kind of uh, relatively long intervals of time. Uh, and even when they do uh, uh, um, kind of move in a more permanent way, they rarely live directly around the wells. So uh, because of these amenities related to the extraction activities, uh, they prefer uh, living uh, in, in places nearby, some, sometimes even across state boundaries, uh, because of higher amenities. Um, and so this is kind of the, uh, the, the motivating fact that justify looking at networks uh, in this context. Uh, and I think the key economic channel, without going into too much detail for the sake of time, uh, is really this idea that work and mobility is selective. Uh, and the way I think about this is that uh, the mobility decision is partly determined by uh, how likely a worker is to receive information about new job opportunities. Um, and this is a, um, a model that's been developed. Uh, it aligns with a model developed by Calvary Mengol and Jackson. Uh, uh, both for wages and employment, the model essentially predicts that because of these information transfers, there will be a positive correlation of, uh, of employment status and wage levels in, in the network due to uh, workers passing uh, uh, on information to each other. Uh, and more in general, there's an established tradition, uh, a research tradition uh, that, that looks in, in economic sociology, uh, economics, uh, in economic geography more in general, that considers the role of social networks for labor market outcomes. Um, again, for the sake of time, let me uh, maybe skip the kind of other previous work just to highlight that this isn't the first uh, uh, study that kind of considered the fracking industry, of course, uh, and the, the diffusion of these shocks. Uh, but it's the first one that really tries to zoom in onto this uh, network dimension and social interaction uh, dimension. Uh, and also an additional uh, kind of caveat is that I'm not uh, endorsing or expressing myself in favor or against uh, fracking uh, in itself. Uh, this, the paper is completely silent about welfare. For a welfare analysis in the US, I recommend the Bartik and colleagues uh, 2019 paper. Um, there is large evidence also of detrimental consequences from fracking activities, uh, and uh, so I'm not expressing myself uh, on on that dimension. Um, uh, okay, so um, a few words about uh, uh, data and methods. Um, I use two main sources for um, uh, for my outcomes. Uh, one is from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, um, the quarterly census of employment and wages. Um, crucially, these are reported at the employer location, so where economic activity is taking place, um, and offer some industry disaggregation, which allows me also to study um, um, spillovers across dif different industries. And the second source uh, for wages uh, is the Internal Revenue Service. And crucially, this one, uh, uh, contrary to the previous one, is reported at the employee place of residence. So these two sources should, uh, should align to the extent that uh, workers live and work in the same county. Uh, but uh, uh, if there's commuting, uh, then I pick up different things with one or the other. And I will rely especially on the IRS, these Internal Revenue Service wages, uh, data points in order to get a, um, uh, an idea of whether or not there is this uh, itinerant worker effect uh, taking place, which would not show up in the BLS uh, data. 
Um, and in terms of the local economic shocks, I align with previous studies uh, in the industry, uh, and I define the shock as uh, the per capita value of new production from oil and gas activity uh, in each year, considering only wells that started producing uh, in that particular year. Uh, for reasons related to how I define the data, which is in per capita terms, I dropped the 2% smallest counties in terms of population uh, because of outliers. A county, uh, for instance, the Loving County in Texas, uh, is uh, very small in terms of population, but has produced a lot of uh, oil and gas, and so this would skew the analysis. Uh, to give you an idea of the geographical profile uh, uh, of what I'm looking at, uh, this is where new production takes place on aggregate between 2005 and 2012. You'll see it's concentrated around North Dakota, Wyoming, uh, parts of Texas and Oklahoma, uh, maybe and something in New Mexico. Um, and then on the social network side, as mentioned, I rely on, uh, on data that I obtained from Facebook, uh, which for every county gives me um, uh, information about how, uh, how uh, many friends it shares with all other counties in the US. Um, so I, obtain, I observe this matrix, uh, uh, which I normalize by uh, the product of the two uh, counties' populations uh, to obtain a measure uh, of relative probability of friendship. So in essence, uh, uh, this measure will tell me, given all the possible friendship connections that I could observe between two counties, how many I actually observe. Um, and this controls for, um, again, the fact that larger counties would otherwise mechanically have uh, uh, higher friendship links. Um, and what I do then is I discretize these matrix into bins of uh, five nearest neighbor each. So for every county, I retain uh, up to the hundredth neighbor. And so I create uh, 20 bins of five each in terms of the first five, the next five, and so on, uh, uh, sharing uh, uh, lots of friendships with each other. Um, and so then I, I sum up the uh, new oil and gas production in these uh, uh, progressively farther away uh, uh, social uh, friendship bins, uh, if you will. Uh, and I can map uh, to give you an idea of, of um, kind of the data I'm working with. Um, how any county in the US is exposed on shocks that are lagged over there. Uh, uh, social have three more minutes. How long? Three minutes. Three minutes. I'll, I'll skip through this, but you'll see that eventually up to the 20th bin, uh, uh, there will be a lot of uh, most counties in the US are, are covered. Um, I discussed the estimating equation. Let me, uh, 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 let me um, uh, skip through it. Now it's a spatial uh, econometrics model, essentially considering these lags. And I address endogenous network formation by essentially partialing out any role uh, of geographical distance or previous migration in explaining uh, uh, social interaction between places. Uh, I'll skip through endogenous production because uh, uh, I think this is pretty standard in the literature just to mention that I, that I use some instrumental variable approach. Um, again, as I said, I do find uh, here I show uh, the decay uh, uh, in my effects uh, considering wages. I observed that as I consider progressively more distant social neighbors, uh, the effects that are initially positive tend to flatten out. Uh, and I don't observe any effect when I consider this partial out measure of social distance using the Bureau of uh, uh, the BLS data. But when I consider uh, the IRS, which is recorded in the place of residence of workers, uh, I do observe uh, still some effects, uh, both when I look at OLS and when I look at uh, 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 to stage least squares up to the 10th nearest neighbor, uh, which uh, uh, roughly means uh, these are places about a thousand kilometers farther away. Uh, so there's some indirect and aggregate evidence uh, um, that speaks in favor of uh, uh, these uh, kind of job information networks that might explain why some, uh, uh, some socially connected places uh, tend to gain from, uh, from shocks that accrue that occur uh, elsewhere in, uh, in the economy. Um, and uh, I'd better stop uh, here then for the sake of time. Uh, happy to take any questions. I think you can spend one or two minutes on, on your conclusions. Uh, okay, I, I mean, I think to, to just uh, um, give an idea of the, uh, uh, of the findings, I, I didn't really explicitly discuss the, uh, the, um, uh, the kind of cross industry effects, but I, I see that they're mainly, uh, um, they mainly occur in mining and transportation, so there's little spillover to other sectors, except for a little bit in services and uh, some pressure on manufacturing jobs uh, farther away, which uh, kind of al aligns with this uh, 
uh, kind of a Dutch disease type of literature and resource course. Uh, and I should say again that uh, um, largely the places it tends to gain are geographically close, but close by, so geographical spillovers are still dominant. Uh, but indeed, uh, I do observe that uh, uh, controlling for uh, uh, for geography and also past migration, there is this uh, uh, this kind of effect that travels up to a thousand thousand two hundred kilometers away, uh, which I could quantify according to uh, two stage least square estimates to about five thousand US dollars per worker for every million dollar extracted. Uh, this uh, for one standard deviation roughly equates to four hundred dollars a year per worker. Um, and again, this I really believe captures itinerant workers that commute over long distances. Okay, thank you very much for this um, for this presentation. Can you perhaps uh, unshare your uh, screen? Yeah. Um. Great. So again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, people in the chat are, are welcome to have any questions for indeed for clarification or suggestions or uh, other comments. Um, I'm, 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 for this paper, I'm also really sorry that the time was rather short because there was so much information in it, both on how you set it up and the intuition behind it and also uh, the results. Um, but I think you, 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 you present it very, very nicely. Um, and you also said that you used Facebook data to somehow uh, to make an index of, of social interaction. And uh, I suppose the Facebook data is for the total population in the, in the states, in the, in the regions. While uh, I can also imagine that the people working in this part, uh, in this specific sector, are, is a specific subgroup of the population. Can you somehow con control for that or, or uh, make a kind of subset of, of people and in social interactions? Is, is that possible? And, and would you think it would, make, would have an impact or it's not? Um, uh it's, it's, it's an excellent point and I really wish I, I could narrow down uh, um, the, my definition of social interaction to the relevant group that I'm looking at. Um, unfortunately, I don't have, uh, I cannot break down the, the social interaction data that I obtained from Facebook any further, so I really just observe it on aggregate uh, at county level. Um, it is potentially a concern. Uh, the way I think about uh, the data I'm working with is that it captures some kind of, it reveals something about how places interact with each other uh, on aggregate. Um, and it's based on the, the universe of Facebook users in, in, uh, in the US. Uh, and so around 2016, when these data were, uh, were extracted, uh, this amounted to just about 70% of the US population. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at other studies in terms of uh, Facebook usership, uh, it's roughly representative of the US population, somewhat over-representing uh, younger, uh, uh, younger cohorts, but that wouldn't be an issue in terms of the population, of the, the fracking workers that I'll be studying. Um, and the other thing to say is that I, um, I don't necessarily think of people directly interacting over Facebook, uh, uh, but I really think about uh, kind of the likelihood of information being challenged via contacts over distances. Um, uh, and then once it enters a county, it might just kind of pass informally across many, uh, many other agents locally. Um, and so one, yeah, again, unfortunately, it's a bit of a black, spot, black box in that yeah, sense, yeah. but I'm confident I'm still picking up something meaningful. Yeah. Good. Uh, Thomas Dantinio also uh, posted a question and he says, most of the impact coming from the use of natural resources goes to the owners of the wheels. I wonder if you can use your model to other shop. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, 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 the model itself, the econometric setup could, could, be, uh, could lend itself to, to study different types of shocks. Um, the, the fracking one is convenient because it's, uh, uh, it's very localized geographically. Uh, and um, uh, and it's plausibly exogenous. Um, so this 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 is the reason why I, I decided to uh, uh, to focus on this. But if if uh, um, anyone has suggestions about some some uh, new type of uh, of shock that kind of uh, fulfills these conditions, I think it'd be very interesting to apply. Thomas, do you have any suggestions? He might be typing now. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the... Uh... Oh, fiscal. Um, okay, well, perhaps you can have a conversation about this. Uh, yeah. 
um, on the side, yeah, it, it's a possibility. Sounds like an interesting suggestion, uh, indeed. Yeah. Any other comments um, or questions? Well, if not, then um, Andreas, I would like to thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and like you said, it can also be downloaded. Perhaps you can uh, put the link in the, um, in the chat so for, for everyone, so people can download the paper if they're interested and um, have more, more comments uh, later on or suggestions or getting inspired uh, by your work. I will, thank you. So thank you very much. And the third speaker of uh, the session is uh, Carolyn. Um, you're, you're here, you're going to talk about labor shares and industry concentration, and the floor is yours. Okay. Um, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Caroline. I'm a PhD student at the London School of Economics, um, just as Andreas in the Department of Geography and Environment. Um, okay, sorry. I just saw the chat picking up. Um, my first online conference, I think. So let's see how this goes. Um, yeah, so the, the topic of today's presentation is industry concentration and labor shares in the context of the regions of Great Britain. Um, the paper has suffered a little bit from coronavirus because my data source has been cut off. So I was hoping to have some more results by this time, um, but unfortunately it is what it is. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. Um, so the motivation for this paper is really um, the growing literature that looks into labor shares globally where we're seeing a decline of labor shares. Um, and I should explain what labor shares are. So basically what I mean by that is the share of labor income in total output or in value added. So essentially the share of output that goes to workers as opposed to the owners of capital. So the business owners or shareholders. Um, and we see that in a wide range of countries has been declining both developing and developed in, uh, economies. Um, and why are we interested in this? Well, because if the share of income going to labor is declining, we might be worried about growing um, inequality um, within the population, within economies. Um, and there's been a, there's, there's a wide range of reasons why the labor share might be declining. Um, and one that's become popular is the rise of industry concentration and um, the mechanism I'm going to go into more detail there later, but basically um, if industry concentration is increasing, that allows firms to charge a markup over their marginal cost and that markup is not necessarily shared with workers. So that increases profits for the firms and those profits are going to the owners of capital, but not to the workers. So then the labor share declines. And as I'm going to show you now, these are exactly the trends that we're also observing in the UK. Um, and I think there might be an interesting regional dimension to this. Um, hmm. No. Sorry. Having a bit problems. There you go. Um, so this is uh, the labor share in the UK and I'm splitting it by regions here, looking at London, other urban areas and rural areas, but we basically see that um, across those regions there has been a decline in the labor share from around 63% um, in 2003 to around 55% in 2014. Um, and at the same time industry concentration has been increasing. So here I'm looking at um, the share of um, output produced by the largest four businesses within a four digit industry. And that has been increasing from just over 50% to, um, to like 62, 63%. So we've seen, yeah, 
big businesses are becoming more dominant within their industries. Um, and here's the regional dimension. So why I think this is interesting is because we can see here that most of these kind of dominant um, four largest businesses within their industries, they tend to be clustered in London and then the wider, wider Southeast region, which are the, um, the wealthiest regions in the country. Um, and then overall also across the other regions, um, we see that those big businesses tend to be located in urban areas rather than more intermediate and rural areas. Okay, so what am I doing in this paper? Basically, the first thing is just documenting the rising um, industry concentration and labor shares in, in Great Britain. Um, then I want to estimate the effect of industry concentration uh, and market power on labor shares at the firm level, and from that back out the regional effects. Um, this last point is still a little bit underdeveloped, but for, for the other ones, I have some really interesting, resu interesting results, I think. Um, so what I'm finding is that there's a negative correlation between industry concentration and the labor share. However, at the firm level, um, there's a positive correlation and we can talk about it, why that, why that might be the case. Um, however, this increasing concentration can only explain around one percentage point in the decline of labor shares. And um, the regional effects that I'm finding are quite small, but I think there's some scope to uh, dig deeper into this. Um, so for the literature that I'm contributing to, um, as I said, there's this global literature into falling uh, labor shares um, with various explanations for why that might be the case. Um, and data issues in that space are also really interesting actually. Um, then the literature into industry concentration, um, and there's really interesting stuff, especially by Thomas Philippon, um, mostly for the, for the US actually, but also for Europe how certain industries have become more, more dominant and what's the role of regulation in that space and antitrust enforcement. Um, and there, there's often a comparison um, between the US and, and the EU because the EU tends to have more stricter antitrust enforcement nowadays. Um, but I think the UK is quite interesting intermediate case because I just see this growing um, industry concentration. Um, I mean, now the UK is leaving Europe, so, so maybe that's something that's been on the, in the wall longer that um, there's a bit of a divergence policy-wise. Um, then, of course, I'm looking at the regional effects. So the, the main mechanism is just the, the location of firms and industries and how perhaps more dominant firms locate in certain regions, but also how a location within a region might contribute to firm growth and dominance. Um, and ultimately, this is all related to regional inequality um, and how these labor shares then affect regional incomes and inequality. The data that I'm using come from the annual respondents database. So that is a firm level survey that surveys all businesses with more than 250 employees in Great Britain. Um, smaller businesses stay um, in the sample for two years. So I could have a panel aspect there, but um, in reality, not every, especially among small firms, not every firm answers each year. So I'm not making use of this panel aspect for now. Um, I have really detailed information about turnover and expenditure. Um, so I can back out um, the gross value added of the firm. Um, unfortunately, the employment data is a bit patchy because it's matched from other surveys, so it's not updated necessarily um, to the point of the survey. But I have an estimate for employment, essentially. Um, so the main variable that I'm interested in to compute the labor share is the gross value added. Basically, that is the total output of goods and services, so total sales, minus the goods and services that go into production. So it's kind of similar to GDP at the firm level, if you want to think about it this way. Um, and then the measure of industry concentration. Um, I'm mostly relying on the herfindahl hirschman index um, of concentration, which is the squared sum of shares of, um, of business sales. Um, and I'm also uh, looking at turnover shares of the four largest businesses. That's the figure I showed earlier. And really the trends are very parallel. So that gives me some confidence 
um, that this rise in concentration is actually really true and happening. And it also holds if I'm looking at different um, definitions of industry. Um, so for the theoretical framework um, that I'm using, basically the way I'm thinking about it is that market power allows firms to charge a markup over their costs. And that markup is not shared with their employees, or at least not fully shared with their employees. So that results in a falling labor share. And then the varying regional incomes uh, impacts just result from firm locations and firm sorting across industries. Um, within this is quite a general setup. There could be different mechanisms um, that results in um, differences in labor share still. So um, the good or bad concentration, this is a term that I'm taking from Philippon and uh, Covarubias. So um, that concentration can be good if the most productive and the best firm grows and dominates an industry that's good for consumers, um, that's good for everybody. Um, and bad concentration, we might think about more um, sort of um, behavior that results in dominance, um, for example, by stifling competitors in some way or another, by erecting barriers to, in, uh, barriers to entry, um, through mergers that results in um, market dominance, but not, don't necessarily increase um, productivity. There could be changing technology that um, allows, or that, that results in sort of natural monopoly positions and um, especially with sort of intangibles and network effects, we think about that way. Um, and the third mechanism might also be monopsony power so that large firms have power to charge higher wages or to pay higher wages to their workers. Um, at the moment, I can't really distinguish between them, but I think I'm especially gonna look into the kind of good and bad concentration um, if I can see any like distinction there. That's something for the future to do. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm regressing the labor share on industry concentration at the, yeah, at the industry level, sorry, and then also the market share of the firm and then um, other firm level and effects and industry fixed effects and year fixed effects. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm measuring concentration with the Herfindel Hirschman index. Um, the market share of a particular business is just the, that business's share in total industry sales or turnover. Um, obviously, these definitions are not perfect um, because I'm just using kind of one concentration measure for the whole country, but some industries are very localized, especially personal services. But, um, you know, the, the extent, the, the true extent of the market is probably not captured or definitely not captured by SIC codes. Um, but it's very difficult to figure out how individual markets are configured and how products can be substituted. So I'm just um, going with this definition for now. Three minutes, uh, Carolyn. Yeah. Fine. Um, so here are the main results. Um, again, the dependent variable is the firm level labor share. And what we're seeing is that here in the top row, um, the concentration at the industry level has a negative effect on labor shares. So if the industry is more concentrated, we see lower labor shares on average. However, the most dominant firms within those industries, so those that have a high uh, market share, that again has a positive effect on the labor share. And I think what can explain this is essentially rent sharing at the firm level. So a firm charges a high markup, um, uh, like uh, in, indus in concentrated industries, firms charge markups, um, but the most successful firms share part of that with their, with their workers. So that then results in these sort of two competing effects um, that ultimately um, the effect is negative on the labor share, but within the most dominant firms, we see that workers sort of benefit from that as well. Um, there's just four different specification. If I can include more control variables, the, uh, the magnitude of the coefficient drops a bit, but the signs essentially stay the same. Then I have a few robustness checks. So here I'm including some um, 
variables on imports and exports at the industry level because um, again i'm just looking within one country but obviously uk uk is an open economy so there's also competition from from imports however what i'm finding is that imports and exports don't really um, have strong effects so there's an, the small negative effects um, from from imports um, which is maybe surprising because imports reduce um, concentration right and increase competition however it might be the case that uh, this suggests that the imports into the UK are more labor intensive so that industries that import more the um, production that takes place in the UK is less labor intensive and that's why the labor share is lower so it's difficult um, to interpret that and unfortunately this variable is only available at the two-digit industry level so it's not very detailed um, then one other check that I'm doing is essentially using a dummy variable for concentration so I'm defining highly concentrated industries where the Hirschbindal Hirsch Hirschman index is above uh, 0.35 I think that's the 75th percentile of the distribution so that's just this dummy of highly um, concentrated industries and I'm interacting it with the firm um, firm level uh, with the firm level concentration with the firm level market share um, and again the the industry effect stays negative then we also have this kind of small uh, negative interaction effect, but the um, firm level effect stays positive, although it's just marginal, marginally um, significant. So and lastly, what I'm trying to do, and as I said, this is probably the most um, like least well-developed part of the paper yet, is just trying to get at the regional effects. Um, so what I'm doing is um, I'm constructing a counterfactual um to to see what labor shares would have been had industry concentration not increased so i'm imputing for each firm in each year um imputing labor share um kind of their market share for the how it would have been in 2002 uh, some firms are in the sample in 2002 um, for others, I'm just imputing it based on a regression and extra extrapolation from 2002. Um, and what we're seeing here is that uh, labor shares would have been maybe around one percentage point higher head concentration not um, increased from that level. Um, and I'm very surprised that the regional differences are not bigger because as I showed in the beginning, um, there are really much more dominant businesses in London. So I think that is, this is definitely something to dig into and understand why those um, effects are not bigger or why I'm not, why I can't find them. So I think some sort of decomposition or like a closer look at the data definitely um, is in the cards there. Okay. Uh, so you're, you're out of time. Okay, that's fine. I think um, we can go to the questions. Because, and we have still have four minutes for questions. So um, I would like to uh, thank you very much um, and also invite uh, the people, um, the tenants to, um, to raise any questions in the chat. Um, and while, um, while people are um, perhaps writing down their question, uh, perhaps you can summarize your, your conclusions, Carolyn, just. Um, yeah, sure. So basically, um, what I'm finding is that industry concentration does have a negative effect um, on the labor share that's kind of confirming this big literature that's already out there. But what I'm finding is that the firm level effects are positive so that there seems to be some sort of rent sharing going on at the firm level. Um, yeah, and then really what I have is more like next steps, as I said, um, perhaps distinguishing between good and bad concentration um, that might give me a more precise estimate of the um, of the effect, um, and then also just refine these uh, counterfactual calculations that I'm showing in the end, um, and really dig more into the regional effects and also, I guess, the regional industry composition in more detail. Thank you. Um, 
I am. Um, there are no questions yet, but I can. I, I I really liked your presentation, and also I wondered indeed if there were if you could if you found any geographical differences. So when you talked about the urban rural differences, which were rather small, I think when I heard your story, I would expect it to, to be larger. Um, could could it also be that it differs between different types of sectors? So that there are certain sectors where it, it's easier also for the owners to to keep the markup and to to not expand and 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 spend it on on labor. Um, so so if you and and could it be that the different types of sectors present in urban and rural areas kind of um, average out your 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 results? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think definitely I should probably look at kind of the conjunction of both regions and industries um, because rural and urban labor markets are just very different, right? Like rural labor markets tend more to be more concentrated anyway, so more specialized maybe in mm -hmm. uh, like is the city like London is much more diversified just because of its size. Um, so I think so that I will definitely um, kind of separate those out even if it's just probably something like tradable and non-tradable sectors, because again, because of the extent of the markets, that's just such an important um, thing to consider. Um, yeah, sorry, what was your, your other question? <laughs> yeah, that was basically my question, indeed. If, if it's not because of the different types of sectors that are present in urban and rural areas, for example, that... I think just probably just a small decomposition of that will help just to understand yeah. um, yeah, what we're dealing with and also how that has changed over time. Um, then one that's kind of related um, is just the changing kind of um, employment practices. Um, if you're going towards a more outsourcing model, either through agency employment or through self-employed um, contractors and freelancers, I think that is just also a big part of the story in a sense because that would just not fall into the labor share but that's then other expenditure um do you also have a paper already working paper or something that not, we uh, it's not um not yet. Published yet i'm almost getting my data access back so then i can obviously hopefully like um work on all of these things and yeah get that yeah. out yeah. well i look forward to see your 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 paper and to see your final results yeah Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to give the floor to the final speaker of uh, this session, which is Aphthimias, and he's going to present on volunteering and regional development. Aphthimias, can you speak a little bit louder? louder? I, I, of course, you're okay. still low, not okay. you know, optimal speed, but you have it clear enough for us. Sorry, uh, I share the, the map. Okay. The loud is okay. The okay. Yes, it's okay. Uh, my research project project is in, is different. How the volunteering lead to the successful region development of cultural site in Greece is the is a part of individual try because I studied in University of Aristotle in Thessaloniki and now uh, try from this direction, the preservation of the, to preserve the cultural heritage in my region. In Skatista, this is the mountainous area in the, in the south Greece and has a significant historical background. The purpose of my presentation is examination to the relation between volunteering and the elements of tourist development, environmental awareness and cultural heritage. The timeline of the research. Uh, firstly, I visit the Mountaineus area of Hertha in Greece, meeting with owners of the Museum 
which is the case study uh, of my research. Uh, web, I do web research about the region, communicate with municipality of Kusani and archaeological surveys, and uh, complete the full paper, and now replanning the, my future work. The, the central question of my research are how does volunteering help in regional development? Why does the knowledge of the local history is needed? Why does the preservation of cultural heritage is necessary? The, the methodology uh, are the bibliography review, theoretical practical example of regional development, and volunteering meetings with the municipality office and the museum office. This is one photo of the region of Sciatista. The Sciatista is located in the, the north Greece and the, the historical background is the Mountaineus area they have emphasis uh, element in the, in the region. The main object of my research uh, are the museum, the folklore museum of, of the municipality of Statista, the region development and the volunteering work. Uh, I like to uh, the region development as a tree which contain these points local crisis transform the main pillars of economical growth because the Seattle is one of the five lowest, lowest region in Greece in the employment. The unemployment men in the, in the young people is over 14%. Tourism development of Seattle and exhibition collaboration with the school and the local community. Uh, the cultural heritage and development as, a, as an umbrella. Uh, firstly, the economical crisis changed the thinking patterns and create new opportunities to global level because the historical background of Statista is very rich. Uh, and uh, from 19th century, there are many, many trade, many, uh, many cultural sites, many monuments, and these, these are from new and, and, and create new opportunities about uh, these points. The preservation of global cultural heritage, the region of has many, uh, many. Uh, countries about the Venetian Empire, Ottoman Empire, Byzantine Empire, and all, 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 all of this mosaic contained in the region, developing the human and social value of volunteering, the spread of the local history from tourism and other activities. Uh, the culture as the main pillar of development, the economical crisis says the thinking part uh, and for the, the, the direction is of volunteering is the attractive solution about this. The, the GDP is a tool, but is not the final result. Uh, I mean that the GDP is a useful tool, but the final results are others as a trade, as the increase the volunteering as a protection of cultural heritage and the growth of cultural heritage helps in the protection, preservation, promotion of the global history. Preservation of cultural heritage. The French historian Pierre Nord supports that nowadays the museums should be referred as a place of memory because they constitute little environments of memory. In addition, according to the Gazi, the museum has public monuments of Remberas and established to meet important needs. Uh, the volunteering is an energetic and dynamic process for the development of uh, cultural heritage. Uh, the owner of the museum 
constrain de haute villa et créer des musées. The Roma is a building from the 19th century and uh, around the museum uh, uh, create volunteering uh, sp uh, spirit. Uh, volunteering in the case indicator of culture, volunteering improves the quality of society life. And uh, uh, one, uh, one historical motto about due to the Marina Mercury, the historian minister of culture in Greece, is the countries that haven't learned from the past, they won't flourish in the present and the future. One motto of the historical minister in Greece. This is the museum in Skatista. Uh, the locals and the young people participate with willingness. And uh, the region development seems uh, the combined with culture him this in this way. The photo of the museum and the following construction to the economical helps to the economical, humanitarian and social crisis in Skatista. Uh, the four points about the creating the volunteering is the global historian influence, the Balkan architecture, the historical of local, the custom and the, tradi the tradition, the museum and innovation about the region, and the demographic problem, which I referred to about the new opportunities uh, which must be created in the region. The European trade, the fair trade and the wines. The region is the has opportunities about and the strong points about the fair trade and the wines. And the this the final the final project about the museum, local society, the municipality, and I try volunteering about one or all of this this part is the is, is five words the social concerns the local history preservation the global cultural influence the innovation and solidarity uh, one of the biggest progress in the museum is the uh, uh, is the the height is the creation of video which presentate the traditional marriage in Skatista. And th this video, a uh, solidarity all local and all uh, society in the uh, uh, general region in the, uh, in the Skatista and promote all Greece and in the other countries in Europe. Uh, the results of this process the Folklore Museum was created as a center of the cultural event in the traditional settlement. The couplet's willingness and the involvement of locals and collaboration with schools and other organizations was beneficial from tourists. Nowadays, many, many children are actively involved in the museum activities and uh, now the role and the responsibility of preserving the traditional architecture. Thank you for your attention. I wait your question about this progress, this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Timios, for your um, for your presentation. Can you can you perhaps unshare the screen? Uh, okay. Um, and I see, you notice there are also some questions from uh, from Carolyn asks you, uh, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you could say more about the motivation of the volunteers to get involved. Is it a social activity or does it give them labor market skills and experience? Uh, in, in the try helps in the uh, uh, municipality of Seattle uh, and, and other a person and the motivation of volunteering is the uh, 
is they keep the young people in the Shati stuff because the economical crisis uh, changed the data. The Shati is very rich region about our trade and wines, but the young people for opportunities, for new opportunities in employment, for an employee uh, above from Shati stuff. This, this project has two goals. Firstly, uh, to know the uh, younger, the history and the tradition in the region, the, the architecture, the uh, urban history, and secondly, uh, to uh, create uh, energetic and uh, psychological uh, spirit in the people, in solidarity. This is the two main points of the project. Uh, my role of this, because this is a part of the, uh, this is a part of uh, my effort, is to promote this, uh, this try and, uh, and see some points about the uh, about this uh, process in Shadista. I I look in my PhD program in the Europe, but uh, now I wait uh, COVID. I don't know any specific <laughs> what I do. Uh, Flavio also asks, um, thank you uh, for your research. What type of volunteering is here involved? Is it related to the museum and cultural promotion? Are volunteers mainly young people from the area? Yes, yes. Three points. Uh, the owners of the museum live in answers, but the uh, but the love of the region of originally rebuilt in Shatista and reconstruct villa from 19th century again, create the museum and around the museum create the solidarity and uh, people preserve, uh, children learn to preserve the cultural, uh, uh, cultural heritage and history about the Shatista. This is the two points, the three points. And a question from, from uh, myself. Um, do, do you think, I think there are uh, different benefits of cultural heritage, um, but would, um, would you prefer to have tourism related to cultural heritage over other types of tourism? Uh, yes, the multicultural spirit and the uh, solidarity spirit about the countries is the main topic about the development of tourism. But I, I, I from the bibliography review, all countries in Europe, many and other countries, has multicultural elements. Uh, oh, uh, but uh, this is a global history. But, uh, but uh, this, this is the multicultural and the global history about the uh, uh, past is, uh, uh, is must to learning because on this way have better past and better future. This is the motto of Melina Merkur. And with the, the COVID-19 uh, situation we are in now, in the Netherlands you see that many more people uh, spend their holidays in their own country. So for the tourism in, 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 in the Netherlands, for, uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite good, or it's quite good people also enjoying their own cultural heritage and see how pretty their own country is. Yeah. Do you also experience in Greece that more people perhaps visit, uh, more, more Greek people visit the, the museum or the region? Uh, uh, some individual and uh, try to uh, create video in YouTube and other social media and promote on this way the cultural heritage and promote from Italy, from, uh, uh, from, from other country the historic, the internet and the uh, is global and on this way, people know about all counters, about all people, is a useful tool. Now, the exhibition and cultural event in the, in the public space 
it's a delay about COVID. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if there are any thank other questions from people in the audience. If not, I would all like to thank. I would like to thank you all very much. I, I thought that, I think this was a very interesting uh, session, and I, I uh, appreciate uh, your work and also the questions and the discussion. I'm I'm kind of sorry that uh, we haven't we don't meet physically, uh, so um, you know we cannot walk out the door and talk a little bit more about your research and and your plans. But still, I think this is a good opportunity to get to know each other's research and to. To, uh, to interact with each other. So um, thank you very much for joining. Also the, all the attendees, uh, thank you for, for listening and for your questions. And I also wish you a very good uh, conference uh, for, for the, the, the keynote session that is following. Um, uh, after this uh, meeting, I uh, hope you join us and I also hope you, to see you somehow in the future online or even better uh, offline. Thank you very much.